This is New Patreon series number 52A. This is a two-part series. We're going to look into the uh, issue of whether the Q hypothesis is really necessary uh, and examine the evidence for what we call the three sources of the three source theory or three source hypotheses behind the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Now we're going to examine several hypotheses for the sources of Matthew and Luke. And first I want to start with the definition. In biblical criticism, an hypothesis proposes an interpretation of evidence. It proposes that. A theory is an hypothesis that explains all the evidence and has been accepted by scholars. Now the proposal for a lost Q document to explain the textual materials shared by Matthew and Luke has been called a theory, but is actually only one of several hypotheses that interpret the evidence. In this presentation, we're going to examine the evidence for and against a Q document or oral tradition. Q from the German word K, meaning source. It's uh, redundant to say the Q source. We can say a Q document or a Q tradition. Now, Mark is used as a source in both Matthew and Luke. Now this is accepted by most scholars and is called the theory of Markan priority. Uh, Mark was written earlier than the other two gospels, probably before the first Jewish revolt, uh, uh, and probably somewhere in the period of 66 to 70 of the Christian era. There's much evidence that Matthew and Luke were composed in the 80s or 90s of the Christian era. So Markan priority pretty much assumes that Matthew and Luke uh, use Mark and there's abundant evidence of that that has been accepted and the the mark and the hypothesis of mark and priority now has really the status of a theory and that uh, is acceptable to both protestant and catholic scholars now an alternative proposal that is widely rejected claims matthean priority that that is matthew was written first it is known as the griesbach theory or the two gospel hypothesis it posits that Mark used both Matthew and Luke as sources. And one of the many problems with this hypothesis is that it would mean that Mark was composed in late first century after Matthew and Luke were written, all evidence to the contrary for uh, the um, priority of Mark, the theory of Mark and priority. Now, some English scholars support the farrer goulder goodacre hypothesis that Luke copied from Matthew, thus dispensing with Q. In other words, all the common material between Matthew and Luke can be counted for because one of the Gospels copied from the other, and he says that Luke copied from Matthew. And we're going to examine this hypothesis in detail later in our presentation. So if you'll see my little illustration of the far hypothesis up in the right hand here, we'll see that uh, the idea is that Matthew drew from Mark and then his own material and then Luke drew from both Matthew and Mark uh, plus his own material. Now once you account for the material that Matthew and Luke took from Mark, Matthew and Luke still have about 4,500 words in common or almost in common. I'm going to be quoting uh, sometimes from uh, Professor Tony Kitty's introduction to the Q source. He's a professor at the University of British Columbia. Now those 4,500 words are hypothesized to have come from a Greek document or oral tradition known as Q. So let's take a look how, at how most modern scholars analyze evidence of sources in the Synoptic Gospels, and that is called the four source theory, which is very widely accepted. So let's take a look at it before we go on with hypotheses for three source theory. <clears throat> so the relationships between the synoptic gospels can be diagrammed in this way. We see that <clears throat> Mark is first uh, and then he is a source for both Luke and Matthew. Uh, and then we have uh, a certain amount of material that uh, is unique to just Mark and Luke. That's the orange. And we have a certain amount of material that is just unique to just Mark and Matthew. Uh, 
This material here is called the Triple Tradition. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These are the Synoptic Gospels, and they're the ones that are uh, very similar uh, in, in many respects to all of them. Now, this is a material that is unique to Luke. People just call it L. It's a material that Luke had at hand that you don't find in Mark and you don't find it in Matthew. This is the material that Matthew knew from his own tradition that he had at hand, and you will not find that in uh, Luke or in Mark or anything else. And this is the material that we call the Q source. This is the called the double tradition. It's the material that Luke and Matthew share. It's about a quarter of of both these gospels. It's um, and so that is the the uh, a basic quick look at the four source hypothesis that is mostly accepted by scholars, uh, both Protestant and Catholic. And we'll talk about why that's an issue, Protestant and Catholic, uh, a little bit later. So the Griesbach two document theory became the two gospel hypothesis. Uh, the ancient church fathers advocated the two-source hypothesis that was advocated by Augustine of Hippo, that Matthew was written first, then copied by Mark, and then Luke copied from both. So that was the theory that uh, St. Augustine of Hippo put forth, and most, many of the early church fathers believed that Matthew was prior to the other Gospels. The two-gospel hypothesis uh, which uh, was part of the Griesbach uh, hypothesis. The Gospel of Matthew was written before the Gospel of Luke, and both were written earlier than the Gospel of Mark. This hypothesis, following an original proposal uh, by Augustine of Hippo, was expanded by Johann Jakob Griesbach in the late 18th century, known as the Griesbach, or two-document hypothesis. It was reintroduced in its current form by William Farmer in 1964, who wrote a famous article called, Is the Q Hypothesis Really Necessary? Or is Q Really Necessary? And it's still supported by some scholars today as the farrer goulder goodacre Hypothesis, which we shall examine later. Now, this hypothesis was the most serious alternative to the two-source hypothesis. Its main advantages over the two-source hypothesis included the fact that it relied not just on internal evidence, that it did not require lost sources like a Q document, and that it was supported by the view of the early church. Unlike the two-source hypothesis, the two-gospel hypothesis concluded that the traditional accounts of the gospels the order and date of publication as well as the authorship uh, that were given by Augustine and so on are accurate. Uh, you can uh, find a nice article on Wikipedia that's well written called uh, The Augustinian Hypothesis. Now in 1924, a very brilliant scholar, still respected highly by people uh, in both Catholic and, and Protestant camps, <clears throat> B. H. Streeter added that two other sources referred to as M, Matthew and L. Luke, underlie the material in Matthew and Luke respectively. Now the strengths of this hypothesis are its explanation of the shared and non-shared material in the three Gospels. Its weaknesses lie in the exceptions to those patterns and in the hypothetical nature of its proposed collection of Jesus sayings, Q. Now, he, he called these sayings M. Later scholars have advanced numerous elaborations and variations on the basic hypothesis and even completely alternative hypotheses. Nevertheless, the two uh, SH commands and supports uh, the support of most biblical critics from all continents and denominations. But modern textual research has shown that Matthew agrees with Mark against Luke, and Luke agrees with Mark against Matthew, but Matthew and Luke never agree with each other against Mark, so Matthew and Luke do not seem to have had access to each other's Gospels. So we can't really 
promote the idea that Matthew copied from Luke or Luke from Matthew. The theory of Markan priority has dominated and is well established in both Catholic and Protestant scholarship. Here's a little uh, diagram of this. So we call it the two source hypothesis that uh, Matthew and Luke both drew from the Gospel of Mark and from a, another tradition, which may have been a written document. It may have been oral tradition or common oral tradition, Jesus sayings, etc. But there were actually two documents behind Matthew and Luke besides their own material. <clears throat> so now let's take a look at the theory of Mark and priority. The theory that the Gospel of Mark was written after Paul and before Matthew and Luke, which is pretty well accepted, is accepted by Protestant scholars. It's usually dated AD 65 before the siege of Jerusalem, since this major event is not mentioned in Mark. But this idea was opposed by the Vatican in its pronouncement of Dei Verbum in 1964 that required Catholic scholars to advocate the priority of Matthew. So from the Vatican, Catholic scholars were not allowed really to support the idea of a Markan priority. It had to be Matthean priority to keep it uh, in line with the ancient church fathers' ideas, which were apparently uh, widespread uh, in the fourth, fifth centuries, but they were not accurate. So let's look at what the theory of mark and priority is and what some of the arguments for it. There are arguments from the content. The infancy counts, the Sermon on the Mount, etc., were added to Mark by Matthew and Luke, rather than Mark's omitting them from Matthew and Luke. In other words, if Mark copied from Matthew or in Matthew and Luke, uh, why does he not include the, all the infancy accounts, the Sermon on the Mount, and all that kind of stuff? Matthew's and Luke's relative brevity in the accounts, all three share as both Matthew and Luke's compressing the text of Mark to add their own material rather than Mark's abridging the content and expanding the words of one or two or both of the others. In other words, if, uh, if Mark copied from Matthew and Luke, why does he leave out so much important stuff? And there's other evidence from uh, the content of the Gospels that shows it was the other way around. And there are arguments from the wording Mark uses less literary diction and grammar <clears throat> and uh, uses a lot of redundancy and difficulty of expression and adoptionist Christology, which is very early uh, in the century, uh, a, a, a Jewish Christian idea, and the use of Aramaic. Uh, these could not be intentional improvements by Matthew, Matthew and Luke rather than Mark's dumbing down of one or both of the others. In other words, Mark didn't take a uh, well-written Greek from Matthew and, uh, and Luke and dumb it down into poorer form of diction and grammar and redundancy and adoptionist uh, Christology and all this kind of stuff. So Mark and priority is also evident where Matthew and Luke refer to omitted explanatory material in Mark as well as in Matthew's adding his own theological emphases rather than Mark's removing them. <laughs> and an uneven distribution of Mark's stylistic features in Matthew and so on. It, it all adds up to um, a copying of Mark or the using of Mark by Matthew and Luke rather than the other way around. And there's a lot of content that's not present in Mark. Mark has no infancy narrative or any version of Lord's Prayer, for example, which both Matthew and, Matthew and Luke have and share. There's content found only in Mark, the parable of the growing seed, the healing of the deaf mute of Decapolis, the healing of the blind man of Bethsaida and the naked fugitive. If Mark wrote first, it is easier to see why Matthew and Luke would omit these passages. These two healings are the only ones in the synoptics involving the use of saliva. And that was a magical technique. Uh, and Jesus was attacked by later Jewish opponents of Christianity, Christianity as being a magician. 
which uh, that was turned back on Simon, who was Simon Mega, Simon the Great, later called Simon Magus, a word meaning a magician. And magicians were uh, considered to be uh, people who deceived people and used false techniques to create illusions. And that's what Jesus was accused of. And saliva, use of the saliva, is something that you find in a lot of the, the, the Greek, Demotic, and Coptic, and uh, Aramaic, and Hebrew magical papyri. So there's a, a good reason why those two healings would have been omitted later in the century by Matthew and Luke. The naked runaway is an obscure incident with no obvious meaning or purpose in Matthew and Luke and theology. So those are reasons why uh, some content found only in Mark doesn't seem to appear in Matthew and Luke. Mark has about 155 verses included in neither Matthew nor Luke, nearly a quarter of his entire gospel. Also, nearly every pericope in Mark is longer than its parallels in Matthew and Luke. That indicates a process of source redaction, source reduction. Several eyewitnesses are named only in Mark. <clears throat> uh, Bartimaeus, Alexander and Rufus, Salome. These people are people who would have been known to readers during the apostolic period, the early period, before the uh, uh, before the, the, the uh, Council of Jerusalem in AD 49 and before the uh, destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70, they would have been known to people during that period and in that cussler, but it, those people were either dead or not known to later Matthew and Luke as people. And uh, that is one of the reasons that uh, they're not named later in these gospels. They're named in Mark because it was earlier. So let's take a look at Professor Alan Garrow's Matthew conflator hypothesis, the idea that Matthew copied Luke. So when it comes to the synoptic problem, and I'm quoting now, there are three pieces of data that have proven particularly difficult to fit into one overall narrative, he says. Sometimes Luke and Matthew are almost identical for extensive passages. The best explanation for this is that Luke copied Matthew or that Matthew copied Luke. Sometimes Matthew looks more primitive than Luke and sometimes Luke looks more primitive than Matthew. This is very unlikely to happen if Matthew was simply copying Luke or if Luke was simply copying Matthew. If Luke used Matthew, then he treated Matthew in a way that is difficult practically uh, unprecedented, unprecedented historically, and which is entirely unlike his treatment of Mark. This suggests that Luke did not use Matthew. I'm quoting now from, by the way, uh, uh, Alan Garrow uh, in his article on the synoptic problem. And he, so he asks, is there a coherent story that can account for these and various other factors? My solution is the Matthew conflator hypothesis, which argues that Matthew used Luke directly, which satisfies data points one and three, while also sometimes conflating Luke with Luke's own source, identifying satisfying data point two. So here's what that would look like diagram. Do we have mark and priority? Luke copies from Mark, <clears throat> then Matthew copies from both Luke and Mark, according to the Matthew conflator hypothesis. Matthew is conflating Mark and Luke's gospel together. Now, Professor Mark Goodacre rejects Garrow's hypothesis on the Bart Ehrman site. It is a site that, that the, that the uh, Biblical critic Bart Ehrman <coughs> maintains, and there's a lot of dialogue that goes on back and forth between biblical scholars, New Testament scholars, on that site, and it's well worth looking at if you can find it online. However, uh, you have to uh, pay uh, so much money to get uh, a subscription to the site to, to hear all these arguments and so on. Uh, but during the period of uh, COVID-19, uh, that would be in um, 
June, July, and August, uh, he waives the fee. And so uh, it's a little easier to get on the site during that period. So here's what Professor Mark Goodacre says on Bart Ehrman's site. He says, Garrow argues that his model provides a good explanation of both the high verbatim, that means the nearly word for word uh, uh, passages in Matthew and, and, and Luke, and the low verbatim passages, these are more like paraphrases in Matthew and Luke of each other. The high verbatim passages are the result of Matthew directly copying from Luke. There are places where Matthew is just Luke in front of him. Here, Matthew is copying Luke without distraction. <clears throat> the low verbatim passages are the result of Matthew conflating Luke with Q, which by the way, uh, Garrow says that Q uh, was actually the Didache of the 12 apostles. Uh, Garrow identifies Q as the Didache. And so he says the, the low verbatim passages are the result of Matthew conflating Luke with this source that is places where Matthew does not agree as much with Luke because he's distracted by one of Luke's sources, Q, i.e. the Didache. As he expresses it, high double tradition passages, that is the, what we usually call Q, are best explained by Matthew's copying of Luke without interference from any other entity. This is what Mark says. So Garrow has tried to prove that the Didache is actually the Q document. This is not accepted by very few people at all. And to continue with what Goodacre says, <clears throat> several of the passages with very high verbatim agreement in Matthew and Luke are passages where Matthew, on Garrow's own theory, is also copying from Mark passages like John's messianic preaching uh, the Beelzebub controversy, and the sign of Jonah. In passages like these, Matthew and Luke can be remarkably close in wording, and yet these passages, there are passages here where there are also parallels in Mark. So Goodacre, who supports the, um, the thesis that Luke copied from Matthew, uh, is... Uh, <clears throat> opposed to the idea that Matthew copied from Luke for the reasons that he's laid down here. <clears throat> so let's take a look at this, this hypothesis that Goodacre is supporting, the idea that uh, is just the opposite of what uh, Ferrer is, uh, or rather what you know, Garrow is supporting. Now the Farrer hypothesis has mainly been advocated by English biblical scholars. It's named for Austin Ferrer, who wrote this, this very important document called On Dispensing with Q in 1955, but it's been picked up by other scholars, including Michael Goulder and Mark Goodacre. This is what it looks like. Luke copied from Matthew and Mark, and Matthew just copied from Mark. Here's a basic argument, and I'm quoting from Goodacre. Uh, an article he wrote called Too Good to be Q, High Verbatim Agreement in the Double Tradition. He says, it is a fact seldom acknowledged that the double tradition material in Matthew and Luke shows a remarkably high degree of verbatim agreement. It is a fact still more rare, rarely acknowledged that the high verbatim agreement makes best sense if Luke is copying from Matthew. The issue is surprisingly straightforward, and yet it is almost always missed in discussions of the synoptic problem. Where two documents show very close agreement and wording <clears throat> in parallel passages, the best explanation is that one is copying directly from the other, not that both are copying from a hypothetical third document. That's kind of Occam's razor, you know, the, the simplest explanation. Where two documents are copying from a third, we should not expect to see the kind of high verbatim agreement that we often see in the double tradition, that is what we call Q. The evidence suggests that Luke had direct contact with Matthew, and this entails dispensing with Q. Now, five arguments were given back in the early part of the 20th century by uh, B.H. Streeter, 
for the impossibility of Luke relying on Matthew. He made them in 1924, but they are still accepted by most scholars. He was one of the best minds in biblical scholarship and a founder of the British Protestant School of Literary, Critical, and Historical Gospel Analysis and the M hypothesis that eventually led to the Q theory, the th hypothesis that there was another source. <clears throat> Unfortunately, he and his wife uh, died in a, uh, 1937 in a disastrous plane accident. But he is revered still by many biblical scholars, including me. <clears throat> Brilliant mind came up with all kinds of things that we now accept. He says, Luke would not have omitted some of the Matthean texts that he did because they are so striking. That is a, that's a simple way of saying uh, there are many texts in Matthew that would have been really important to, to Luke uh, for his theological point of view and for his story, etc., but he doesn't include them because he did not have Matthew in front of him to copy from. He says that Luke sometimes preserves a more primitive version of a text that is also in Matthew. That By primitive, we mean... Uh, Poor, poor grammar um, uh, and uh, uh, wording and several other kinds of things that are more typical of, uh, of Mark's gospel, which is uh, very koine. Luke follows Mark's order, but does not do the same with Matthew. He doesn't follow the Matthean order. And Luke uses the material less skillfully than Matthew. Matthew's gospel was, was, was beloved in the early centuries of Christianity because it's actually the best written and has the most interesting stuff in it and uh, is, is uh, uh, refers back to the Old Testament and the, and, the, and the proof texts and all kinds of other things that were important to the early Christians. They weren't, they didn't know so much about history. They uh, were more interested in the literary and theological and ecclesiastical impact of a gospel. And Luke does not use the material within the same Mark and paragraphs as Matthew. In other words, the places where Mark connects two bits of things together, two pericopes together, uh, he doesn't do that, but Matthew does. So that, that there's an awful lot that mitigates against that. So his observations, way before we had all the information we have today, and all the research has been done uh, in the last hundred years since he wrote this, uh, it was already evident to this man with his brilliance and his uh, brilliant command of Greek and everything else that uh, uh, Luke could not have uh, copied from Matthew. So, we're going to talk about Q and the four source hypothesis accepted by most scholars today. And a lot of people refer to it as the four source theory. Uh, and that's how much, how well it's been accepted, uh, although it still is really a hypothesis. Now, Bart Ehrman, Professor Ehrman, uh, accepted a $1,000 donation to his subscription blog which you, this is, this is the, uh, I'm giving you the, uh, the URL. It's just <clears throat> airmanblog.org, and that's where all kinds of interesting uh, issues are debated by New Testament scholars, but it requires a subscription. So he accepted a $1,000 donation to his blog if he or another scholar would post a debate between Mark Goodacre and Alan Garrow, which he did. No, this is a debate between the people who think that uh, the theory of the hypothesis that Matthew copied Luke and the other one that Luke copied Matthew. Uh, people wanted to see that, that debate. And he says, as you know, I agreed to allow Mark Goodacre to respond to Alan Garrow's unusual view of how to explain the synoptic problem as part of the $1,000 challenge by blog participant Evan. Some of you enjoyed going down into the weeds yesterday with Mark. Uh, 
Today I post Alan Garrow's reply to Mark's response, and if you like the weeds, here are some more. Uh, he, the weed just means <laughs> going down into details that may or may not be relevant. Uh, if nothing else, these posts show why it is hard to make scholarship simple and accessible to the non-expert without simplifying it out of recognition, which is the ultimate goal of this blog. Just one point of clarification, Ehrman says, <clears throat> I'd like to make about my own views in light of what Alan says below. I am not at all committed to the form of Q reconstructed by the International Q Project, and I agree with him totally. I don't think there was a uh, Q was an, an early form of the Gospels, but they, they've done wonderful work in putting together what the Q material was. He says, I'm not at all committed to the form of Q reconstructed by the International Q Project. We'll talk about that in the next uh, in the next part of this this. Uh, presentation. Not in the least. I simply think there was a Greek document that Matthew and Luke both used for a number of their traditions, and I'm happy to call it Q. <laughs> uh, this is, again, the, the <clears throat> what I've shown you. The It's called the four-source hypothesis that there was this common material. Uh, we call it the double tradition, which scholars refer to as Q and the International Q Project uh, took it, um, uh, did a great deal of research putting together what Q would have been, uh, but they they went a little too far in designating it as a, a proto-gospel, uh, as, a, as, a, as in gospel form, which it was not. It was in the form of uh, uh, wisdom sayings, like the Gospel of Thomas. <clears throat> if it was a written document. Now, I agree with Ehrman's view. <coughs> Excuse my voice. <coughs> uh, I agree with Ehrman's view, and uh, I, I've uh, stated this several times, and why. The argument that Luke copied Matthew doesn't adequately explain the synoptic relationships. The far hypothesis that Luke copied Matthew. No. Nor does the argument that Matthew copied Luke, uh, that is uh, advocated uh, by Garrow and other people. There is a fourth source, perhaps a sayings document or an oral tradition, and we might as well call it Q. If a document, it was not a gospel as it was uh, the people in the International Q Project wanted to call it proto-gospel. But it was a collection of sayings like the Gospel of Thomas. And the attempt to prove it was the Didache uh, uh, that Garrow has made simply fails. Q was not the Didache. There isn't really enough evidence to show that. <clears throat> 